Oral questions, question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Prime Minister repeated that there had been no funding or staffing changes to Canada's pandemic early warning system, but officials at the Public Health Agency say that's not correct. Staff were redirected to other departments. The system went silent for 440 days without any alerts after having operated seven days a week for 20 years. Why is the Prime Minister misleading Canadians on the decision to close Canada's early pandemic warning system? Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Every step of the way, our response to the pandemic has been guided by science and evidence and public health advice. In fact, in early uh, January, when Dr. Tam first understood the risk that COVID-19 play, uh, play, uh, placed on Canada, she convened the group of other public health officials from across the country. Um, Mr. Speaker, when I understood that scientists in Public Health Agency of Canada did not feel that we were using the Global Public Health Information Network to its best purpose, I have ordered an external review and I'll have more to say about those that, that in days to come. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Minister said that every step of the way they were seeking advice from experts, but these public health professionals say the government was too slow to respond. The government waited weeks after news of a virus out of China before they asked the professional pandemic health care professionals for advice. In the meantime, Canadians were given the wrong advice on the border, on human-to-human -human transmission, and on mask usage, including by that minister, Mr. Speaker. Can the government now admit that shutting down Canada's early pandemic warning system has left us playing catch-up on COVID-19? The Honourable Minister. I thank the member opposite for the question and in fact every step of the way we have responded to science and evolved our advice to Canadians as the science has evolved. As all members in this house know COVID-19 is a new pathogen. So much uh, that we don't understand about the pathogen is still to be discovered. But as we have learned through research, through science, through uh, the development of evidence across the country, we have a, a, a revised our advice to Canadians because we know that Canadians understand that science does evolve and that we will provide them information as as soon as it becomes available. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the, the Minister said they've evolved their advice throughout the pandemic. Their answers are evolving to tough questions as well, Mr. Speaker. The pandemic warning system was shut down by what health officials describe as shifting government priorities. That's political speak, for it was a political decision, Mr. Speaker. Professionals dedicated to protecting Canadians from the pandemic were told to instead focus on vaping. The government has said that a review is going to be underway, but they've never said who is doing it. The minister has the chance to say that to the House today. Who is examining the decision to close the pandemic warning system, and will the investigation be made public? The Honourable Minister. Knows. As soon as I heard concerns from scientists within the Public Health Agency of Canada, I ordered an external review. That external review is being planned as we speak. And Mr. Speaker, this House will know as soon as I do uh, the names of the people that we will appoint to, to conduct that external review. And of course, Canadians will have full access to the information uncovered by that review. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are concerned. The Liberal government repeats every day that everything's fine, all is going well, and that the health minister has everything under control. It's kind of relative, that control. The medical officer of health said that only one-third of the promised tests were being done. Can the health minister admit that she doesn't have the situation under control. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, over 9.7 million Canadians have been tested for COVID-19 to date. That's with, in great part, the contribution of uh, the federal government, $4.28 billion, Mr. Speaker, towards uh, testing in provinces and territories so they can deliver on their responsibilities and their health care systems. And Mr. Speaker, we're also supporting with direct lab assistance. In fact, four federal labs are up and running to support provincial capacity, especially in the case of surge. Mr. Speaker, we will be there for Canadians on testing on all other aspects of responding to COVID-19. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. A lot of money, not much action, Mr. Speaker. Rapid testing was promised, but it took months. 
and it took conservative pressure to get them to get off the pot. Now the minister's promising lots of tests, but only 30 percent are actually being delivered. The delay is aggravating the second wave day after day. Can the minister admit that she talks a lot but doesn't do much? Mr. Speaker, since October 21st, over 2.4 million rapid tests have been delivered to provinces and territories, 890,000 to Ontario, 577,000 to Quebec, 345,000 to BC, 303,000 to Alberta. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to approve tests as they are proven safe and accurate and will ensure that provinces and territories have access to the most current technology. The Honourable Member for Montarville. Mr. Speaker, I hope the Prime Minister took the opportunity of his discussion with uh, French President Emmanuel Macron to apologize a couple of weeks late for the or to offer his condolences for the sickening attack on Samuel Paty. The National Assembly and the Premier of Quebec firmly defended freedom of expression. Only the Prime Minister has downplayed this horrible tragedy by blaming the victim partially by saying that we should be aware of the impact of our words and actions, Mr. Speaker. Did the Prime Minister take the opportunity of his call with the French President to apologize for his unfortunate remarks? The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, it's our colleague who should apologize for the things he's saying which are different from the truth. The truth is that we have all, all across Canada, here in the House, we were all horrified by what happened in France. We said that we stood in solidarity with our French friends, and we do. Today, the Prime Minister had a very good discussion with President Macron. Obviously, we expressed our sympathies to the families of the victims. and. Let's remember, Canada is one of the champions of freedom of expression around the world. The Honourable Member for Montarville. Mr. Speaker, two weeks to the day after the barbaric attack on Samuel Paty, the Prime Minister said the following about freedom of expression. I think there's always a very important, very delicate debate to be had about possible exceptions. We saw this with his position on academic freedom. The Premier is more in favour of limited freedom of expression, a timid, inoffensive freedom of expression. When is the Prime Minister going to start this big debate on exceptions to freedom of expression? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's only one day, it wasn't two weeks, it was one day later when Canada reacted to express our full solidarity. That's what I did the day after the attack. I expressed on behalf of all Canadians how horrified we were and that we would work together against intolerance and terror. The Prime Minister of Canada has been clear. Canada will always be one of the great champions of freedom of expression in the world. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I spoke with workers in Quebec, and they told me about their challenges, the fact that they're having trouble making ends meet. At the same time, web giants are making record profits. So on the one hand, we have people making record profits, and on the other hand, we have workers who are having a hard time making ends meet. I fight for people. Why is this Prime Minister working for web giants? The Honourable Minister. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. Mr. Speaker, just this Tuesday, our government, the first in Canadian history, had this idea of attacking the or ad addressing the situation of web giants so that they're treated the same way as other players in the Canadian arts and cultural market. And that's going to be billions of dollars more that will be invested into Canadian culture by these web giants. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a couple of weeks ago I spoke with Jennifer and Kane, Dominion grocery store workers who barely earn minimum wage, frontline workers who are fighting for a living wage. All the while, the owner of Dominion Grocers and others 
Galen Weston increased his wealth by $1.6 billion during the pandemic. On one hand, we have billionaires making record profits, and on the other hand, workers struggle to get by. Why does a Liberal government want people like Kane and Jennifer to pay for the cost of the pandemic and not people like Galen Weston? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for the question, and I'd like to acknowledge that the frontline workers in retail and groceries have been heroes over the course of this pandemic, and that we will be there to support ordinary middle-class workers and do whatever it takes to be there for them. Mr. Speaker, we have not come lately to the debate around supporting middle-class Canadians. The very first thing we did when we came into office in 2015 was raise taxes on the wealthiest 1% and cut them for the middle class. Mr. Speaker, the NDP voted against that motion. Over the course of this pandemic, we have extended record supports that have landed on the kitchen tables of 9 million Canadian households. The Honourable Member for Secoutimi Le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, in 2015, according to the Prime Minister, Canada was apparently back. Canada didn't get a seat on the Security Council. The Prime Minister doesn't inspire confidence on the international stage. With his poor judgment when it comes to freedom of expression, today the Prime Minister had to grovel before the French President to undo the damage. Why does the Prime Minister have to call the French President and not the other way around, as was the case for the Premier of Quebec? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker. I'd like to inform my honourable colleague, for whom I have a lot of respect when it comes to international affairs, it's perfectly normal for one to call another. This morning, I was speaking to my German counterpart. The transatlantic relationship has never been as strong as it is today. The Prime Minister of Canada takes every opportunity, as I do, to, to speak to our European counterparts, and we will keep doing that because, Mr. Speaker, in the world we live in today, we have to work with countries that share our values. That's precisely what we're doing, and we will keep doing that, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi Le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, we know the Prime Minister is going to call the French President today, and that's damage control when you're not doing so well. The Liberal Party likes to use the term Team Canada. Well, Team Canada is in the is lagging behind internationally. Will the Prime Minister explain to the French President why he was so soft on freedom of expression, and, or will he explain what he really thinks, which is that there are limits to this freedom? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for giving me this opportunity to share with Canadians the fact that Canada is a leader. We were there on the issue of the Uyghurs and Russia and human rights, on freedom of expression. Mr. Speaker, I challenge members to take a look at our history and see how close we are to our allies on the defense of such dearly held values. Thompson Caribou. Mr. Speaker, this well, government has blamed COVID-19 for their failure to deliver on an action plan for murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. Do they not realize that domestic violence is increasing dur during this pandemic and lives are at risk every day? Chief Constance Big Eagle has asked how many more women need to die until Canada recognizes that something needs to be done and this can't be put on the back burner any longer. Will the minister answer her poignant questions? The Honourable Minister. I thank the member for her question, and I thank uh, and I. Our hearts are with the uh, families and survivors uh, of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, and two spirit and gender diverse people every day. And we know that 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 women and girls and two-spirited people are still dying and that we need a national action plan. I was pleased to speak with uh, Chief Big Eagle yesterday. I, I, I think that she is feeling um, that the, the working of the core working group and the ways that, that we will deliver um, regionally relevant um, uh, in distinctions-based approach and that will be... The Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Um, Mr. Speaker, a parliamentary committee, all parties, called for an action plan way back in 2015. Um, Charlotte Glitty Murray, a family member who testified during the National Inquiry hearing three years ago, stated, 
after the inquiry was done, I feel that the government just dropped us. By us, I mean the family members. There was no follow-up whatsoever after we gave our testimonies, and that is not right. Three years, no follow-up, no plan, enough talk. When will Charlotte see action? Honourable Minister. I do find it a bit rich that, it, that a member of a government that fought against having a national inquiry and that the Prime Minister of the day said it wasn't even on his radar is now finally listening to the families. The families and Hilda Pierce, Anderson Pierce is, is organized with the families, the Manitoba Coalition, the Family Liaison Units. We are working very hard to deliver a national action plan that will stop when? this tragedy. When? I just want to remind the honourable members that heckling via video is not a good thing and we know who you are, we just don't want to point it out right away. The honourable leader of the opposition. Here. Mr. Speaker, we learned yesterday that a prospective buyer has been found for the Come By Chance refinery in Newfoundland and Labrador. We know that the Steel Workers Union has been working hard to make sure the refinery and its workers have a future. Definitely a lot harder than this government has been. Will the minister commit to an expedited regulatory approval if a sale is finalized? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the uh, come by chance, uh, we are thinking about the come by chance workers and they are facing uncertainty, worried about their jobs in the future. The Competition Bureau uh, is looking at uh, with the situation and monitoring it closely, and that certainly. The uh, acquiring uh, is going through the process that it has to go through. We are monitoring the, the situation closely and lo looking at whatever ways that we can support, we will do so. Thank you, Minister. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, while this government is monitoring, the union is working hard to secure staffing and capacity numbers at the site so that if the sale is finalized, jobs will be protected in eastern Newfoundland and Labrador. But we've seen with this government, they drag their heels on regulatory approvals, especially when it comes to energy pro projects. Come by chance is more than 500 jobs at the refinery and 1,400 jobs in the province. Will the minister today commit to expediting all, all approvals so that workers in Newfoundland and Labrador will have their jobs protected? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as the member very well knows, this is a transaction, this is an independent transaction by independent parties. We are there to certainly to support and certainly uh, whatever uh, actions that we can take and make sure that we can support th that transaction, we will be there. Our focus is to support the workers of Come By Chance and to make sure that there is a future for them in, this, in all the projects that, that, that they are in, involved in. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Liberals say they don't interfere in judicial appointments, but there sure are some strange coincidences. For example, in 2019, the Justice Minister appointed Robert Dysart and Arthur Doyle to the bench in New Brunswick. Both are donors in the New Brunswick riding of the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. They also helped this same minister pay back a $31,000 debt he ran up in a bid for the Liberal leadership. Did the Justice Minister talk to the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs before appointing his donor cronies? The Honourable Minister. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, I am proud of the process that we set up for judicial appointments. We are currently appointing competent judges that reflect Canada's diversity. The advisory committee works in an independent fashion. They make their decisions based on merit. We do some checking after the fact, but I'm the one who makes recommendations to Cabinet. I'm very proud of the results, Mr. Speaker, and we've appointed people of all political stripes. The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. Mr. Speaker, but I'm wondering, because there are some really weird coincidences. The Justice Minister has also appointed Charles Leblanc and Jacques Pinet in 2019, again in New Brunswick. Oddly enough, they also helped the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs to pay back his $31,000 debt. So that's four people in the same province who helped the same minister pay, pay back the same debt 
and they were all appointed to the bench that same year. Do you have to know the Minister of Governmental Affairs in order to become a judge in New Brunswick? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I just said, we make our appointments based on merit. After having gone through an advisory committee, which is independent, arm's length, those people are doing a good job. It's a transparent process based on the quality of the candidates and diversity. I'm very proud of the results. As I said, Mr. Speaker, we have made appointments of people of all political stripes. The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. Well, I can't wait till the Justice Minister appoints a bloc member. Meanwhile, the neighbor of the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs was appointed to the bench in 2019. The year before, it was the wife of the minister's brother-in-law who got an appointment. At, eventually, it just all gets to be a bit much. It reminds me uh, of the Jean Charest days in Quebec when he appointed people based on their liberal affiliation. He got a list with post-it notes on the side to show which way candidates voted. Is the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs the Minister of Post-its federally? The Honourable Minister, Mr. Speaker, as I just described, we have put in place a transparent process that is based on quality and diversity. We have a process that appoints competent judges that reflect the diversity of Canada. All appointments are based on merit. And I'm very, very proud of the results. We have appointed very high quality, very high caliber people all across the country. The Honourable Member for montmagny lillet Kamouraska, rivière du loup Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On immigration, there are applications for work permits that are still pending for people who are already here in Canada and spousal sponsorships that predate the pandemic. In some cases, they've been waiting for two years now. The bureaucratic apparatus is causing labour shortages in my riding and elsewhere in Canada. Instead of talking about 2013, shouldn't the government start by processing applications that have already been made? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We acted quickly to put in place a family reunification process for families that are already in the system. And I'm very happy to announce measures to expedite processing. And we're hoping to pr process 6,000 applications per month uh, between now and the end of the year. The Honourable Member for Les villes -Pinière. Mr. Speaker, under the Prime Minister's new judicial appointments process, the list of recommended and highly recommended candidates gets vetted by the Prime Minister's office before the final selection is made. Mr. Speaker, before it gets vetted by PMO, does the original list come from the office of the Justice Minister first? Yes or no? The Minister of Justice. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, I am proud of the process we put in place for judicial appointments. We've been appointing competent judges who reflect Canada's diversity. All appointments are based on merit. Recommendations are made by advisory committees. Yes, we do diligently vet those lists to ensure that the candidates are high caliber and have a good reputation in the legal community. But, Mr. Speaker, I am the one who makes the recommendations to Cabinet. The Honourable Member for Les Bilobinières. Mr. Speaker, once PMO has vetted the list of names, the process takes its course, and the list goes back to the Minister of Justice for the appointments to be made. Mr. Speaker, can the Justice Minister tell us if any highly recommended candidates from the original list were swapped out for recommended candidates for certain appointments, and if so, why? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member 
is describing a process that simply doesn't exist. Mr. Speaker, we have a process that is clear and transparent. It's based on merit. The work is done by the advisory committee. They recommend people, and we do some checking. But it is me and me alone. I make the recommendations to Cabinet. For North Island Powell River. Mr. Speaker, this government has been told again by the Canadian Human Rights Commission that they are discriminating against Indigenous children. And every time Indigenous people are faced with injustice in this country, a Liberal stands up in this House and, and claims that they care. But when they're given a direct order to fix systemic racism, they fight Indigenous kids in court instead. When will this government do not only the legal thing, but the right thing and start funding Indigenous child and family services? fairly. I just want to remind the honourable members that when they do speak, please check to see if your mute is on. It, it, inter it interrupts the person asking the question. It's one of the realities of hybrid that we all have to live with. And it's just a reminder, just like the heckling or the talking, it's one of those things that, uh, well, it, it, it is a different time. The honourable minister. Hi. Hey, yeah. Mr. Speaker, the overrepresentation of Indigenous children in care she, is a sad uh, and dark part of our shared history lost. that we must address. We've been clear. This government has been crystal clear. We intend to compensate First Nations children harmed by the discriminatory child and family services policies. Throughout this, pro po this process, our focus remains on advancing a plan that prioritizes the best interests of the individual child and puts the safety, well-being, and security of that child at the forefront. We work closely with all the parties involved and found consensus on a number of key areas and a safe compensation process as part of, in particular, the joint framework for the payment of compensation, and we will continue with that good work. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Speaker, the survivors of St. Anne's Residential School won yet another huge victory in court this week. The court threw out the arguments of the Liberal government lawyers who've done everything to try and deny them justice. Even the Attorney General in Doug Ford's Ontario was standing with the survivors. So my question is for the Minister of Crown Relations. Her lawyers suppress the evidence of horrific crimes. She has spent millions in a mean-spirited legal war. When will she end this toxic campaign and agree to sit down with Edmund Matatawaban and the survivors and negotiate a just solution? When will she do that? The Honourable Minister. As the member knows, the, to ensure the expeditious and efficient administration of the URSA, two administrative judges, one from the West and one from the East, were designated to hear all the requests. As he knows, Ms. Bruning appealed to the administrative judge's decision to have this enhanced request for direction to be heard by the Western Administrative. The court decided to have the matter heard by another Ontario Superior Court because the Eastern Administrative Judge's decision to recuse himself. We are absolutely committed to reconciliation, healing, and justice for all the former students of St. Anne's and all residential schools. Honorable Deputy d'Orléans. Merci, Monsieur le Président. We know COVID-19 has affected all aspects of Canadians' lives, from their health to their livelihoods. This month is the 10th annual Financial Literacy Month, and it is notably different than years past. Financial literacy can help Canadians navigate these uncertain times and access the resources that are available to them. Est-ce que la ministre de la can the Minister of Middle Class Prosperity and Associate Minister of Finance tell this House about the importance of financial liter literacy in this unprecedented time? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my Honourable colleague for, for Orleans for her question and for all her hard work on behalf of the people of Orléans. As we continue with emergency support measures and we turn towards the recovery, it is important that each Canadian have the information they need in order to take decisions for the future. Literacy also offers important skills for well-being, from learning to protect against fraud to planning for your future. Whether you are a young student setting financial plans in motion or a senior planning for a safe and dignified retirement, financial literacy tools can help ensure everyone has the support they need. Together, The Honourable Member for Halliburton Quarter Lakes Brook. Mr. Speaker, nearly 2 million Canadians are employed in the charitable and not-for-profit sectors. As we all know, almost all of these organizations have been impacted by the pandemic and are hurting. 
In many cases, donations have dried up, but yet their staff workload is increasing. We've all seen examples in our communities of how they've stepped up in unprecedented ways at a time of national crisis. So when, Speaker, can critical frontline charities and not-for-profits expect to receive support to help them bridge through the pandemic? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are proud of the record that we have uh, achieved with respect to being there for the organizations that are serving Canada's most vulnerable people. Uh, they're facing uh, tremendous challenges. That is why we moved ahead with the Emergency Community Support Fund, $350 million provided to the Canada, uh, to the Canadian Red Cross, the United Way Centre Aid Canada, and the Community Foundations of Canada to act as agents to disperse that money to all the communities based organizations that are serving the most vulnerable people in this pandemic. The Honourable Member for Halliburton, Quartha Lakes, Brock. Speaker, there must be a better plan in place as we begin the post-COVID recovery process. Charities and not-for-profits will be integral in this process. Yet, the, as the service sector charities reopen, financial hardships <coughs> will still be significant. However, major organizations that I'm meeting with tell me that proposals before the government now are being ignored. Will the Minister tell us how he will ensure that these charities that are right now providing childcare, housing, food, clothing to Canadians will be there in the months and years to come. Yeah. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, th providing $350 million so that organizations can continue to do the important work is not certainly ignoring them, as the Honourable Member suggests. In fact, we have been there from the beginning to make sure that the organizations that we rely on to serve the most vulnerable in our communities continue to do that and, in fact, increase that. That is why not only have we provided the Emergency Community Support Fund, we provided assistance to food banks and community food programs. We'll continue to be there for the charity sector because we know that they're stepping up even more than they usually do at a time when Canadians need them the most. The Honourable Member for Regina Waskena. Mr. Speaker, the Alaska to Alberta Railway will create 28,000 jobs, provide another route out of landlocked Saskatchewan and Alberta for our exports, and lower the cost of groceries in the Yukon and Northwest Territories. Will the government join the Conservatives in supporting this $17 billion private sector infrastructure project, or will the Prime Minister let the application sit on his desk for six months, as he did with Tech Frontier? The Honourable Minister. Uh, we, as a government, are fully committed to ensuring that good, sustainable projects get built in Canada and that they are assessed in a timely, fair and a rigorous way. With respect to this project, as I said uh, a couple of weeks ago when this question was posed by the opposition, we have not received an initial project description, but like with all projects, if we receive it and when we receive it, we will certainly assess it and uh, we will do so in an expeditious manner. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Medicine Hat, Cardson Warner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The cancellation of pipelines has been felt across Alberta and Canada. With major capacity backlogs, railways cannot ship both Canada's oil and food production. Mismanagement and liberal ideology imposed on infrastructure will hurt us for generations. With ports clogged, railway backlogs and pipelines cancelled, the government needs to act or finally admit they are dividing our country by crushing Alberta's resource economy. Will the government commit to a fulsome, expedited review of the Alaska to Alberta Railway and not just more red tape and dithering excuses? Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, this is essentially exactly the same question as was posed a minute ago. Um, and as I said, we are certainly committed to ensuring that projects as they come forward, irrespective of where they come forward, are assessed through a rigorous and timely and fair process. That is exactly what we put into place through the Impact Assessment Agency, uh, Impact Assessment Act, which, uh, which is an important improvement on the way that we actually assess projects in this country. Uh, with respect to this project, we have not yet received an initial project description, but if and when that is actually provided by the uh, proponent, uh, we will certainly assess it through the process in a fair and rigorous and timely way. The Honourable Deputy de Shefford. The Honourable Member for Shefford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. More than 60,000 seniors may see their guaranteed income supplement cut if the federal government doesn't receive their tax return by the 29th of November. This is 60,000 low-income seniors 
who are already struggling with the pandemic. We should recall that still today, people over 70 aren't supposed to go out more than the strictly necessary. And for months, almost all in-person services have been closed. It's almost impossible to get help from the CRA. Can the government assure us that no senior in need will see their GIS cut during the pandemic? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much uh, to the member for raising this issue. I really appreciate her bringing it forward. Right now, our focus is supporting seniors during this pandemic. We're focused on providing the direct financial support that seniors need to help coping with the added costs. And we work closely with our community support organizations. The direct financial support, as she knows, provides more than $1,500 for low-income couples. And we will continue to work to ensure that seniors have the supports that they need and be there for the seniors. Thank you. The Honourable Deputy de Shefford. The Honourable Member for Shefford. Mr. Speaker, we're discussing aid to seniors. And there's something else I'd like to talk about on that topic. Throughout Quebec, we're getting messages from new recipients of the GIS who have asked who asked for the $200 COVID benefit in the spring. They made the request on time, but then they didn't hear anything. The CRA took months to process the files, and the result is that months later, seniors are seeing this $200 benefit refused because the CRA claims that they missed the deadline. The government is cutting benefits for our neediest seniors due to their pure incompetence. What is it going to do to rectify the situation? Mr. Speaker, providing supports to seniors during this difficult time has been a priority for this government. As I've already mentioned, we provided a special one-time pay payment to seniors on old age security of $300 and an additional uh, amount of $200 for seniors on guaranteed income supplement. That went to all seniors that were already receiving the guaranteed income supplement. I appreciate the member for raising this issue. I'll look into it further and we'll have more to say soon. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Tobik Mactaquack. Mr. Speaker, we have been hearing testimony at committee from sectors that have had little to no engagement from the minister over the ongoing fisheries crisis in Nova Scotia. No peaceful resolution will come if the minister continues to re refuse meaningful engagement with all stakeholders by shifting responsibility to a third party. The minister needs to take the lead on this. It is her responsibility. Mr. Speaker, when will the minister be meeting with all stakeholders to come to a peaceful resolution? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, actually, I have been meeting with all stakeholders uh, since the very start of this uh, this issue. Uh, I meet with commercial harvesters on a regular basis, as well as with First Nations communities. Mr. Speaker, we know that the First Nations uh, have the right to fish for a moderate livelihood. We will continue to work with them to make sure that we implement this right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for West Nova. Mr. Speaker, the community of Sonyaville has been ground zero for the fisheries crisis here in Nova Scotia, and the wharf is still being occupied by Indigenous fishers. The District 34 lobster season will be underway in a few weeks, and the commercial fishers who pay DFO to dock at the Sonyaville wharf are wondering when they will finally be able to get back into preparation mode. Can the minister explain how the Port Authority can get the wharf back so fishers can prepare and start their season on time. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we know that these ongoing tensions have been very difficult for everybody involved. We are working diligently to make sure that we have a solution. Uh, we're working with First Nations communities to make sure that they are able to implement their moderate livelihood right. We're also listening to commercial harvesters with regards to the concerns they have and making sure we're doing everything we can to address those. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to have those conversations and we will continue to move forward to find a peaceful resolution to this ongoing challenge. The Honourable Member for New Brunswick Southwest. Mr. Speaker, this fisheries minister has been MIA when Indigenous and commercial fishers are relying on her for answers. A motion passed unanimously at the Fisheries Committee gives this minister until November 20th to appear and explain herself to fishing communities and all Canadians. Nearly every witness we've heard from has said this minister dropped the ball. She's been hiding for far too long when Canadians deserve answers. Committee members want to meet with the Minister of Fisheries. When will she be ready to meet with the committee and fulfill her duties? Will she respect the November 20th deadline? Minister. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, actually, I believe I am scheduled to appear before committee in November. Uh, I'm happy to do that. I have been engaged in this file since day one. I have met with the commercial harvesters as well as with Indigenous communities. Mr. Speaker, we know how important it is to find a peaceful resolution to this ongoing issue. I will continue to work with all, com all parties involved to make sure we get to that point. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As Chair of the Standing Committee on Veterans Affairs, it's an honour to stand and remind Canadians that from November 5th to the 11th, Canada will be marking Veterans Week across the country. The pandemic has certainly changed things, but through virtual ceremonies, social media and more, Canadians will still have the opportunity to pay their respects to our veterans. Can the Minister please speak more on the importance of Veterans Week? The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my honourable colleague from Cambridge for the question. Veterans Week is vitally important as it provides us with the opportunity to remember and honour all those who have worn the uniform. From the battlefields of Europe to the mountains of Afghanistan and beyond, the service and sacrifice of our veterans will never be forgotten. This year, things look a bit different, but all Canadians are encouraged to wear the poppy, take part in many virtual ceremony days, and uh, make sure sure that we remember our veterans. To all veterans, we say thank you, lest we forget. The Honourable Member for Fort McMurray Cold Lake. Mr. Speaker, my riding of Fort McMurray Cold Lake experienced many challenges over the past five years. The collapse of oil prices, cancellation of Energy East and Northern Gateway, the horrific fire of 2016, the pandemic, the floods of 2020, and now the upcoming clean fuel standard, which may add up to 11 cents per litre. Does the Prime Minister think it is wise to levy this new tax scheme in the middle of a pandemic and a failing economy? The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Can you hear me? Uh, there we go. Very good. Please proceed. Okay. Sorry. Mr. Speaker, using cleaner fuels in our buildings, our vehicles and industries is one of the, the biggest steps we can take to reduce emissions. The clean fuel standard will cut pollution by up to 30 million tons in 2030, which is the equivalent of taking 7 million cars off the road. It will, though, concurrently create enormous opportunities for farmers and for companies producing real renewable fuels. It will encourage investments in energy efficiency that will help Canadians save money, and it will promote the faster deployment of electric vehicles as an important enabler for economic opportunity and an important part of fighting climate change. The Honourable Member for Surus Moose Mountain. Mr. Speaker, last week a white paper titled Incentivizing Large-Scale CCS in Canada was released, indicating ways to encourage investment. Construction of three projects could see $2.7 billion in GDP and support over 6,100 jobs. These three large-scale CCS projects, like Boundary Dam and my riding, could see over 5 million tonnes of CO2 being captured annually. The Minister says nice things about CCS but does nothing to encourage investment. When will he put his words into action? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, certainly, CCS is an important part of, uh, of technologies addressing climate change, and certainly the Boundary Dam uh, example is a very good example of taking action to reduce emissions from coal-fired power plants. Um, carbon capture and storage, as well as a range of other technologies, including hydrogen technologies, uh, are going to be a critical part of ensuring that Canada can exceed its 2030 targets and can move to uh, achieving net zero by 2050. It will be part of the plan that we will be bringing bringing forward to discuss with Canadians uh, to, as to how we enhance our ambition with respect to climate change. And certainly I look forward to talking to the, the Honourable Member for Edmonton, Wetaskiwin. Mr. Speaker, there is no one in the world more committed to clean energy production than Canadians working in the oil and gas sector. Yet because this Liberal government's made it impossible for the private sector to build a pipeline in this country, we continue to import hundreds of thousands of barrels a day. After the U.S., the top source countries in recent years are Saudi Arabia, Nigeria and Algeria. Could the minister tell us if oil imported to Canada from Saudi Arabia, Nigeria and Algeria 
is subject to the same rigorous regulation on upstream and downstream emissions as oil coming from Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Newfoundland. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have been there since day one. We've approved the Lion 3 pipeline. 7,000 7, jobs have been created. We approve as well to support Keystone XL unwaveringly. 1,500 jobs created right now. LNG Canada, we're building it. Thousands of jobs. TMX, we got it approved. We're getting it built. 5,600 jobs created so far. NGTL 2021, we approved it. Thousands of jobs to be created. Orphan and inactive wells, $1.7 billion, thousands of jobs created. And the wage subsidy, more than 60,000 resource workers in their jobs in a pandemic in Alberta alone. We will be there for workers. We will continue to be there for workers. The Honourable Member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us all the importance of supporting workers and businesses in communities across Canada ensuring safe workplaces for all. From coast to coast to coast is vital we rebuild our economy together. In my community of Brampton Centre, businesses like Tandoori Flame and Toro Pharmaceutical INC are focal points for our recovery. And my constituents wants to know what steps are being taken. Can the Minister of Labour update this house on how the government is sure. ensuring Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Brampton Centre for that very important question. I wish to commend all partners, labour, industry and my PT counterparts, for working collaboratively to keep workers safe. In addition, I wish to extend my gratitude to the hardworking team at the Canadian Centre for Occupational Health and Safety. They've worked tirelessly and quickly to help employers have the health and safety resources that they need. These resources have helped guide employers as they live up to their responsibility to provide safe and healthy workplaces. Our government has invested $2.5 million to assist CCOHS in this in very important work. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Due to massive cuts and total disregard by Jason Kenney's government, the Campus St. Jean, uh, the only Francophone campus in Western Canada, is at risk of shutting down. The campus prepares many of Western Canada's French immersion teachers. Without it, kids like my daughter, Kelty, might lose the opportunity to learn French in school. Knowing that the Alberta government is refusing to support our vital Francophone community, will the minister step in to make sure that people in Western Canada, people like my daughter and other people, have the ability to learn French? The Honourable Minister. I'd like to thank my Honourable colleague for her uh, question and her advocacy on the issue. And of course, I want her daughter to have the chance to study at Campus Saint-Jean. We as a government want to make sure that we work across party lines to support Campus Saint-Jean, to make sure that Franco-Albertans have access to post-secondary uh, education in French, and as well that all Western Canadians have access to uh, post-secondary uh, education in French. And we really hope that the Conservatives will join us in making sure that Jason Kenney and the Conservatives in Alberta live up to their end of the deal and make sure that we can save Campus Saint-Jean. Thank you so much. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I raised this issue on October 2nd. I asked the Prime Minister again, will Canada stand up to protect our whales? Recently, on the coast of Scotland, whales were stranded and found dead, and it was connected to a NATO training exercise offshore. Exactly the same kind of U.S. naval training of bombs and torpedoes is planned for the coast off the Pacific Northwest. The U.S. Government plans to go ahead. The state of Washington has done more to protest this than our own government. When will we stand up and say we do not accept incidental takings of southern resident killer whales? The Honourable Minister. 
Thank you to the member for Saanich Gulf Islands for this question. As she knows, our government is committed to the protection and the recovery of the southern resident killer whales. The U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is leading the review of the U.S. Navy, the US Navy proposal. DFO is engaging with NOAA on this matter to ensure common understanding of the proposed activities and the need to mitigate any potential impacts to whale and whale habitat. We will continue to work closely with our U.S. partners on actions we can each take to protect this species. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank <laughs> you.